you know that if we have a periodic function that you can write this as a sum of sines and cosines, right? So this is basically your Fourier series. So sines and cosines or complex exponentials, that's, that's the same thing. Now, what we want to do in this video is not look at periodic functions, but rather functions defined on the interval between 0 and 1, and write those not as a sum of sines and cosines, but as a sum of Bessel functions of a certain order. Of course, the big question is why? Why on earth would you do that? So pause the video and see if you can come up with a reason when this would be a, a good idea. Now in theory, you can take any function and write that as a sum of any other set of functions, as a sum of basis functions, provided that that set of basis functions is complete, which means that it can represent any function. So mathematically, then it doesn't really matter which set of basis functions you use, because as long as they're complete, they will be able to get the job done. But that's, of course, in mathematics, in an abstract sense. If you concretely want to use that series expansion to come up with a numerical result, then the choice of basis functions could be important, because say, for example, you're interested in achieving a precision of, let's say, three uh, decimals, and it might be that for one set of basis functions, you would need a thousand terms in order to get that precision, whereas for another set of basis functions, one or two or three terms would, would suffice. So it's clearly import important to make a clever, smart choice of a set of basis functions. And a good choice would be to find some basis functions which already incorporate some of the physics of the problem. Then intuitively, you could hope that this is a smart choice of basis functions, and then you get better precision, better convergence. So if you're dealing, for example, with a problem that involves cylindrical coordinates, we know that the natural ally of cylindrical coordinates is, is Bessel functions. So then you might consider trying to use Bessel functions as a basis set to expand a certain function. If, on the other hand, you're dealing with periodic functions, then the physics of the problem tells you, okay, there's something periodic going on, and therefore, well, your best friends are sines and cosine functions. And then in that way, you can hope to get much faster convergence. But this is the reason why we're interested in having an, analog, an analogous thing like a Fourier series, but then uh, something involving Bessel functions. I'm only going to call that a Fourier Bessel series. Okay, so that's the goal. Now, if you cast your mind back to when you were first exposed to these uh, Fourier series, then you might recall that a very useful tool there was the orthogonality between sines and cosines. Thanks to that, it was very easy to derive the expansion coefficients in that series expansion. And we're going to do something similar for our Fourier-Bessel series. We're also going to look at an orthogonality relationship, but of course a slightly different orthogonality relationship. And this is where Lommel's integral comes into play, because Lommel's integral was, if I recall, if I remind you, an integral of a product of a weighting function x um, times jn l of x, jn k of x. And in our case, because we're going to restrict ourselves to functions defined on the interval 0 to 1, we're going to integrate that between 0 and 1. And Lommel told us that this thing is equal to x divided by k squared minus l squared k j n plus 1 kx j n lx j n lx minus a term l j n plus 1 lx j n kx. So this is what we've derived in a previous uh, video. Now let's have a look at uh, what happens for a very specific choice of L and K. Let's say that for L and K, we're going to take two zeros of the Bessel function of order N, and we're going to call them Xi i and Xi j. So they will be zeros of the Bessel function of order N. If you make this particular choice for L and K, you can easily verify that the integral that we've written here will be equal to zero. Why is that the case? Well, let's take a look at the lower bound. 
if we evaluate that at x equal to zero, then this term will make sure that there's nothing left. If we evaluate this at x equal to one, then we need to look at these particular terms here. So this will become Jn of Xi i, and this will become Jn of Xi j. But precisely because Xi i and Xi i and Xi j are zeros of these functions, these terms will also vanish. So this means that the integral is, uh, is zero. Now, what on earth does this have to do with an orthogonality relationship? Because an orthogonality relationship requires a scalar product, right? But let's say we define a scalar product between two functions, f of x and j of x, uh, g of x rather, um, as the integral between 0 and 1 of the product of x and then these two functions. So obviously we have the freedom of choice to define a scalar product any way we want. In this particular case, we take the product of our functions and we multiply that by, by a certain uh, weighting factor, weighting function. And we've also made the choice of integrating between 0 and 1. And depending on your application, depending on the functions you work with, you make a different choice of weighting function or integration bounds such that you can derive useful relationships. And in our case, we can say that under this definition of scalar products, um, these two functions here will become uh, orthogonal. Good. So how are we going to make use of this? Well, again, let's go back to what we want to do. We want to have a function f of x expanded as a sum which involves Bessel functions. So for Bessel functions, we're going to use Bessel functions of a certain order. And that order n is a free parameter that we can choose either arbitrarily or depending on the, the physics of the problem. And then the Bessel functions we're going to use are of the following form, xi i of x, where these guys are again the zeros of the Bessel function. And you can show that there's an infinite countable number of them. So you will have an infinite sum here going over Bessel functions uh, of this following form with scaling factors related to the zeros of that, uh, that Bessel function. And the big question here is what are the corresponding expansion coefficients for each of these, uh, these different terms? So that's the main goal when trying to derive a Fourier Bessel series of this particular function f of x. So how are we going to find out what these a's are? Well, the thing we're going to do is we're going to take that expression, multiply that by x, j, n, and then a different basis function. Let's call that xi m of x, and then integrate the whole thing between 0 and 1 and see what happens. So pause the video here and implement uh, these particular operations. So what we're doing here is we're basically taking the scalar product of this equation here with the function jn xi m of x, and that becomes the integral from 0 to 1, our weighting function, our first function, and our second function. Okay dx. But also on the right hand side, we're basically looking at scalar products between two functions. And in this case, the scalar product uh, between jn xi i of x and jn xi m of x. And uh, yeah, there's orthogonality going on, right? So these will be orthogonality, these will be orthogonal. The only exception is when uh, the summation index i here will be equal to m because then you will have the scalar product of the function with itself. So that's, uh, that's basically then the only term left, am integral from zero to one x jn squared, xi m x dx. And uh, this particular integral is not governed by Lommel's integral, uh, which we use to derive the orthogonality because for Lommel's integral, we really needed a situation where the k and the l, remember the scaling factors were different. And in this particular integral, uh, they, they are the same. So this is the only term that does not vanish. And that gives you a nice explicit formula for one expansion coefficient at a time. So you can just replace that, keep on multiplying this with, with different uh, trial functions. And then one by one, you can recover the uh, expansion coefficients. Because what you have on the left-hand side 
But if you assume that your function f of x is known, then here you have an integral, which you can calculate, either numerically or analytically. So this thing you can calculate. Um, the thing here, this normalization integral, the product of this function with itself under the scalar product, that's also something which you can calculate uh, analytically, but that's something we're going to do in the next video. But as soon as you have calculated these two things, you know what uh, the expansion coefficients are.